You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for April 5th, 2024. This week... Statins in diabetes, antiarrhythmic drugs in patients with heart disease, tricuspid valve interventions, and an ACC preview. First topic is statins and diabetes. The Lancet Diabetes Journal published yet another big meta-analysis of statin RCTs. There's been so many of these, perhaps because statin drugs are the most studied drugs ever. This meta-analysis from the CTT group, that is the Cholesterol Treatment Trialist, focused on the effects of statins on diagnoses of new onset diabetes and worsening glycemia. Now, you've heard this story. Let's review it again based on this new paper. The CTT has patient-level data of many, many RCTs. I report on this issue because it comes up a lot in statin discussions. The trialists included only trials with more than 1,000 patients. This led to 23 RCTs with, get this, 154,000 individuals. 19 trials were statin versus placebo. Four trials were low versus high-intensity statin. The main questions were, what is the effect of randomization to statin on new diabetes diagnosis and worsening of glucose in people with diabetes? The median duration of these trials was 4.3 years, and I will come back to that in my discussion. There were about five main results. First, compared with placebo, a lower moderate intensity statin resulted in a 10% proportional increase in the diagnosis of new diabetes, which sounds terrible, so we should discuss absolute risk. Recall this meta-analysis had greater than 150,000 people. The absolute risk of a new diabetes diagnosis in the statin arm was 1.3%. The absolute risk of new diabetes in the placebo arm, 1.2%. So 1.3 versus 1.2% leads to a relative risk of 10%. It was statistically significant, again, because there were a lot of patients. Now to high-intensity statin. The proportional increase here was 36%. Absolute risk were 4.8% versus 3.5%. That leads to a relative risk of 1.36. Now, you might wonder why the absolute values were that much higher in the high-intensity trials. I mean, it was 3.5 to 4.8% versus 1.2 to 1.3%. Well, here was another key finding of the meta-analysis. Quote, for each trial, the rate of new diabetes among participants allocated to receive placebo depended mostly on the proportion of participants who had at least one measurement of hemoglobin A1c. This proportion was much higher in the high intensity than the low intensity or moderate intensity trials. Now, I did not realize this before. I had thought that the higher intensity statin probably had more diabetes producing effect, and maybe it does. But it equally could have been that the trialists just looked harder for diabetes in the high-intensity trials. All right, another main finding, blood glucose effects were modest. For patients with diabetes, statin allocation increased the mean glucose concentration by minimal amounts. For instance, in the high-intensity statin allocation, increase was only 1.4 milligrams per deciliter. Another finding. Patients most likely tip into the diagnostic criteria for diabetes uh, when they are closest to the threshold. In fact, nearly two-thirds of all new diagnoses of diabetes occurred in the highest quartile of patients' blood glucose. And finally, among the trial patients with diabetes, the rate ratios for worsening glycemia were 1.10 
for low intensity or moderate intensity statin therapy and 1.24 for high intensity statin therapy compared with placebo. So my comments, there is something about this drug, statins, or perhaps it's the LDL lowering effect that causes a modest increase in glucose. The editorialists cite two studies, one in New England, one in JAMA, that find an association between gene variants that lead to lower LDL levels and a higher risk of diabetes. So one way to look at this issue is to say that diabetes risk from statin drugs is an important adverse effect. We should worry about it. Yet I don't think this is the right way to think about it exactly. Here is why. First of all, I wonder if the higher incidence of diabetes is just a phenomenon related to reaching an arbitrary threshold of glucose or hemoglobin A1c, as most of the new diagnoses of diabetes occurred in patients who were close to that threshold. And there are, of course, observational studies that support the thresholds we use to diagnose diabetes, but these thresholds are fairly arbitrary. Second, and a far bigger reason not to worry too much about this signal, is that if the diabetes signal caused serious harm, it would cause this harm via higher rates of cardiac events, right? Diabetes is most bad because it increases cardiovascular events. Yet, that is not what we see. We see the opposite. Statins induce a highly reproducible reduction of cardiovascular events. In other words, the primary endpoint of statin trials, cardiovascular events, incorporate this particular adverse event of new diabetes. This comes up a lot in all kinds of trials, right? For instance, I will discuss the issue when I preview the danger shock trial. That's the Impella versus standard care in acute MI-related cardiogenic shock. The primary endpoint of danger shock is mortality. That's a very broad endpoint. Yet the trialists have also wrote that they will measure serious adverse events specific to the device, such as limb ischemia and bleeding. However, these adverse events should be incorporated in the primary outcome, which is death. For if these adverse events are bad enough, they should affect mortality. So indeed, choice of overall death is why many of the early heart failure, early MI trials were so helpful because when you measure something so broad, it should incorporate adverse events. In the statin example, the very broad MACE endpoint incorporates any signal of higher rates of diabetes and glucose issues. Now, there is one caveat to this, though. One caveat to the diabetes signal being incorporated in MACE primary endpoints, and that is the issue of time constraints. Recall that statin trials measure outcomes over four years, yet it may take a a diabetes signal longer than that to cause an increase in cardiovascular events. I doubt it because when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves of statin trials, the degree of separation gets larger over time, consistent with the known benefits of longer times exposed to lower LDL. But yet the benefit-harm ratio of the drugs remains somewhat uncertain, over many years outside the time window of the trials. All right, next topic, antiarrhythmic drugs for PVC suppression in patients with heart disease. And I did not misspeak there. I've often talked about how important the CAS trial is, antiarrhythmic drugs versus placebo in post my patients who had ventricular arrhythmia. This is one of the most important trials in all of medicine. Recall that for years in the 1980s, we treated post my patients who had ventricular arrhythmias with drugs that suppressed ventricular arrhythmias. We did this because observational studies showed that ventricular arrhythmias was a marker for early death. We assumed that suppression of the ventricular arrhythmia would reduce outcomes. But CAS showed not only did this not work, but there was also a much higher death rate in the antiarrhythmic drug arm. CAS stopped a harmful treatment, but more importantly, that trial taught doctors the danger of using observational data to establish treatment norms. It emphasized the importance of RCTs. However, however, one major problem has been the over-interpretation of CAS. FDA has slapped a black box warning on the 1C drug fleconide. The label says, don't use it in the presence of, quote, structural heart disease. 
This, I think, is a total failure of evidence-based medicine. That's because CAST enrolled patients who were post-MI and then had EFs in the 20 to 30% range. A lot of patients, I think, are denied helpful arrhythmia suppression therapy because of this flawed trial translation. And that is why I want to tell you about a modest study from the University of Pennsylvania EP group, first author Mohammed Rod. Jack EP published this case series of 34 patients who had, get this, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, high burden PVCs, and an ICD or CRTD backup. Before I tell you the results, I should say that high burden PVCs that occur in patients with left ventricular dysfunction are bad because they can A, further decrease LV function through an unknown mechanism, as well as decrease the amount of BIV pacing if there is a CRT device. Now, here are the brief results of this study. 23 of the 34 patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy received flecainide, 11 received propafenone. Those are the two class 1C drugs. Most patients, 62%, had failed other antiarrhythmic drugs or catheter ablation prior to this class 1C antiarrhythmic drug initiation. The PVC burden decreased from 20% to 6%. That was highly statistically significant. The left ventricular ejection fraction increased from 33 to 37%. Biventricular pacing percentage increased from 85 to 93 percent, and sustained ventricular tachycardia, two versus nine patients, and admissions for decompensated heart failure, two versus three patients, decreased compared with the 12 months prior to class 1C antiarrhythmic drug initiation. Now, my comments. I highlight this modest paper because it exposes the mistaken translation of CAST. Uh, no. No, and double no, I am not advocating for the willy-nilly use of 1C antiarrhythmic drugs. All antiarrhythmic drugs deserve serious caution about their cardiac effects as well as their drug-drug interaction effects. You should be well-versed in pharmacology if you use these drugs. But we should always remember that CAS studied post-MI patients with serious ischemic LV dysfunction. Yes, 1C drugs can depress LV function, through their sodium channel blockade effects, right? They're negative inotropes. But in this study of patients who already had bad left ventricular function, use of a negative inotrope actually increased LV ejection fraction. And that's because suppression of PVCs helps LV function. I want to point you all to a brilliant paper, one that you should read and keep in your library and read it again and again. This is Daniel Kramer and the late Mark Josephson wrote in Cirque Outcomes, quote, three lessons for evidence-based cardiac EP. And one of these lessons they wrote about was the appropriate translation of CAST. This is one of the best papers I have read in my EP career. I'll link to it. Everything they wrote in 2010 applies to everyday decisions today. Third topic today is that FDA has cleared the triclip. This week, FDA approved Abbott's Triclip Transcatheter Edge-to-Edge Tier, T-E-R, uh, system to repair severe tricuspid regurgitation. This approval, of course, was likely because of the favorable advisory committee vote. I've spoken often about the regulatory trial here called Triluminate, so I'll keep it brief here. Uh, Triluminate enrolled 350 patients with severe TR. Uh, one group got tier. The procedure, one group got tablets, no procedure. The endpoint was hierarchical with death or tricuspid valve surgery, heart failure hospitalizations, and quality of life as measured by the KCCQ. The trialists used a win ratio and the trial was positive. But of course, there was no difference in death or tricuspid valve surgery, no difference in heart failure hospitalization. The driver of the positive trial was quality of life, the KCCQ. The issue, the monster-sized elephant in the room, was that there was no placebo group. The tier group knew that they had had the procedure. The medical group knew that they did not get the procedure. It's completely, utterly impossible to assess a subjective endpoint like quality of life without a proper control. But even without the placebo or sham control, the tier group did not even improve on the six-minute walk test. Now, the authors have offered a post hoc analysis that correlated the amount of TR reduction with the degree of improvement of the KCCQ. 
This may reassure some, but it's no replacement for a proper sham control, which would have been, I think, quite easy to do in this case. Now, the triclip approval follows shortly after approval in February of the percutaneous tricuspid valve replacement. Uh, this is made by Edwards, and it's called the EVOQ, E-V-O-Q-U-E valve. Approval of EVOC was just as dubious. First, they had no ad, uh, advisory committee meeting. They based this on the TRISEN-2 trial. The safety endpoint of TRISEN-2 was derived from real-world data from tricuspid valve open surgery, and the benchmark was set at 44%. Really, I, I did not misspeak about that either. That was the benchmark. You could have a 40% complication rate with the new tricuspid valve replacement, and it would still meet its safety goal. The first efficacy endpoint of TRISEN-2 was TR grade reduction or the proportion of patients with TR less than moderate. The second efficacy endpoint was a composite of KCC Q improvement, New York Heart Association functional class, and six-minute walk test. The trial compared the valve versus uh, optimal medical therapy, which is primarily oral diuretics. Again, no uh, sham or placebo control arm. Now, it took about two hours to place the valve. The hospital stay was four days. The results favored the valve, but of the 96 patients in Trison 2 randomized to the valve group, 26 had safety events. So this was a 27% rate of adverse events, and that, of course, easily passed the safety goal of 44%. These safety events were things like three deaths, 10 severe bleeds, two device complications, and 14 new pacemakers. Recall that pacing when you have a tricuspid valve will require a coronary sinus lead, which isn't impossible, but it's not so normal either. The first efficacy endpoint showed a marked reduction in TR. That's good. The hierarchical endpoint was also positive, but of course, each of the endpoints in that second efficacy endpoint are susceptible to placebo effect, and there was no placebo. Now my comments. I want to start with something positive. I've seen a handful of patients who I believe have TR as their major problem, and in most of these cases, they are in no shape for surgery. So these two innovations may help them, and so innovation is good. The thing is, though, primary tricuspid regurgitation, that is TR that is the major problem, and not just part of a global heart failure condition, that is quite rare. My second problem is that Evidence generation doesn't have to be this weak. The FDA could have demanded a sham procedure. We have it for PCI. Why not tricuspid regurgitation? A proper placebo would be able to sort out the true benefit in these subjective endpoints. Then we would know whether this really works or not. The third issue is that I worry especially about the valve replacement. Bleeds, deaths, device complications, and new pacemakers. A 27% rate of complications. Now, maybe valve iteration is going to make this better, but these were the rates of problems in motivated and experienced operators in a trial. So it's probably going to be worse in the real world. And, of course, there's a lot of patients with TR out there. There's a great potential for overuse of these devices, especially if reimbursement becomes favorable. I worry. We shall see. The evidence generation of these procedures tempts me to be quite cynical. All right, finally, uh, some words on the ACC, uh, which is coming up this weekend. It begins this weekend in Atlanta. This podcast is going to come out Friday afternoon. As you head out, please take a look at my ACC preview column. That's up now on the heart.org MedSafe Cardiology site. I tweeted it out this morning. Now, I'm not going to be in Atlanta because I'm attending the European Heart Rhythm Association in Berlin, but I will write about some of the major trials from ACC. The thing is that ACC will have a number of trials that could change cardiology practice. First is the Danger Shock trial, which will test the transvalvular microaxial flow pump versus standard of care in patients with acute MI related cardiogenic shock. Now, I am normally allergic to saying brand names, so for simplicity's sake, I'm going to make an exception here and refer now, from now on as the Impella is the name of the device. Of course, that's a brand name. Now, the pre-danger shock history is that Impella was widely used, but has yet to be proven in a proper trial. I know, that sounds crazy, but it's true. 
Three small trials of Impella versus balloon pump were non-significant, as was a meta-analysis of those trials. Even worse, the balloon pump, which the Impella has been compared against, has failed in its major trials against standard of care. And I think that is why the danger shock was designed to test Impella versus standard of care. The primary investigator, Dr. Jacob Moeller from Denmark, and his colleagues have designed a very detailed trial. They selected patients carefully, took them 11 years to recruit more than 300 patients. These patients had to have a low blood pressure, need for vasopressors, they had to have elevated lactate, low ejection fraction, and they could not be comatose on arrival, nor could shock be greater than 24 hours. The primary endpoint they chose is excellent, all-cause death. This is the best endpoint, alive or dead, no bias. They chose to measure this not at 30 days, like the intraatic balloon shock 2 trial, but at 180 days. I'm going to be interested in hearing why they chose this later time point. They will also measure important safety endpoints, including bleeding, vascular complications like limb ischemia, need for surgical intervention or amputation, significant hemolysis, device failure, and damage to the aortic valve. In their protocol paper, the authors compared patient characteristics of the 314 patients that they had recruited in their trial thus far with the intraatic balloon pump shock 2 trial and the culprit shock trial, which was two PCI strategies. All patients in the danger shock trial had elevated lactates, which was not the same in these other trials. Danger shock patients also had lower systolic blood pressure and ejection fraction than the two other trials. My friends... This is such an important trial. It comes more than a decade after acceptance of this device. The Danger Shock team deserves immense congratulations for persisting for a decade to get this data. But it boggles my mind that we don't do these trials before acceptance of such an important device. Now, two quick words on interpretation of Danger Shock. This trial will have high mortality rates. Of course, this is the nature of cardiogenic shock trials. In their protocol paper, they estimated a 60% death rate in a control arm. So how we think about uncertainty around the effect size in such a trial may vary compared to a typical cardiovascular outcomes trial with a low mortality and composite MACE outcomes. Second thought, in the translation of the trial, whatever the results are, we need to think hard about who these patients were. While it's an amazing accomplishment to do a trial over 10 years, this means that these are quite special patients. Look hard at Table 1 and listen attentively to Dr. Moeller when he describes these patients. Now, speaking of an important trial, I want to say a word about the TACT-2 trial. This is an RCT of chelation therapy and high-dose vitamins to reduce major adverse cardiac events in patients with diabetes. Recall that the first TACT trial came out positive. Chelation actually did reduce major adverse cardiac events, but the medical establishment did not embrace it. It was too non-traditional. Primary investigator of TAC-2 and TAC-1, Gervasio Lamas, was not deterred. He instead took a subgroup from TAC-1, patients with diabetes, who seemed to get the most benefit, and then he retested this group in TAC-2. We hear the results on Sunday. This, too, will be huge news, if it is positive. Lamas will not only have found another disease-modifying therapy in diabetes, but he will also open up an entirely new way of thinking about preventive cardiology, right? That is the role of heavy metals in causing atherosclerosis. There's already a fair amount of data in the effects of heavy metals in causing poor health, but it's largely been ignored. TAC-2 could change all that. As a curious person and someone interested in science, TAC-2 is like the Super Bowl. Week in and week out, I write about, podcast about studies that at best provide an incremental change. TAC-2 stands to truly change the game of preventive cardiology. Even though I will be in Germany at the European Heart Rhythm Association, I can't wait to hear this presentation. The third biggie at ACC is the Reduce AMI trial. Yet another Scandinavian trial, this one from Sweden. The test here is the use of beta blocker after MI. Swedish investigators will randomize about 5,000 patients with acute MI to standard oral beta blocker versus no beta blocker. That's right, no beta blockers. Importantly, patients will have to have preserved LV ejection fraction. Of course, this is now the majority of AMI patients, 
now that urgent PCI has become standard. The primary endpoint of reduced AMI will be similar to the original beta blocker trials, and that is death or MI. I'm also interested in the secondary outcomes of, of symptoms, right? Functional status, health quality related life, because the only way to sort out true beta blocker side effects is with a proper placebo design. If this trial comes out non-significant, which I think it will, because even the original beta blocker trials like BHAT, ISIS-1, and COMMIT were not that impressive, a dogma will have been changed. We will no longer reflexively put these patients on beta blocker. And as a person who loves minimizing the burden of medical care, that will make me happy. Now, there are many more trials to learn at ACC. There's going to be empagliflozin after MI, semaglutide in obese patients with heart failure and diabetes, be new therapies for triglycerides, and more trials comparing TAVI valves. It's going to be an exciting meeting. In the coming weeks, I will recap these important studies here on this Week in Cardiology podcast, so tune in. That's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time, give us a rating, write us a brief review. If you don't agree with something I said, go to the website, leave a comment. I love learning from these. Until next week, post-ACC and European Heart Rhythm, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.